<clears throat> it is a privilege to introduce our keynote speaker in the 49th conference of the Israel Society for the Promotion of Classical Studies, Professor Sheila Murnahan, the Alfred Reginald Allen Memorial Professor of Greek at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Professor Murnahan has produced articles, books, articles, commentaries on Greek literature, of course, especially epic, tragic, and historiography. I have a because of my own personal interest, a partiality to her work on Herodotus, also gender in classical literature, and, um, and a very impressive um, list of publications on classical reception. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, these are topics, uh, Greek literature, gender, classical reception, which have been addressed in this conference and in previous conferences of the, of the society. Uh, the first session yesterday, for example, uh, was on reception, classical education, classics of popular culture. And I think that, that, uh, that Professor Murnahan's book with Deborah Roberts, who fortunately is also attending on childhood and the classics written in America, uh, 1850 to 1965, would have fit really right in with the discussion yesterday morning. It's not my purpose to summarize Professor Murnahan's a complete body of scholarship that would be quite impossible and unfair to her, uh, seeing that it encompasses uh, six books and well over 60 articles covering a wide range of topics and problems in Greek epic tragedy uh, and, and historiography uh, and gender, the topics that I mentioned, uh, studies which range from close and skillful philological studies in both her earlier and also recent work, uh, including commentary. She's apparently not working on uh, one of the, for the Green and Yellow Cambridge series, a commentary on Sophocles' Ajax and critical editions of plays as well. Uh, so from this to more adventurous, let's say conceptual studies of ancient literature, such as um, studies that I particularly enjoyed reading on, on the Greek, on the chorus in Greek drama. And if you had been able to be here, uh, Bridget, I would have taken you to an experimental theatrical production in Jerusalem, which consists solely of combined texts from Greek choruses translated by the Israeli poet Aaron Shabtai, which are staged uh, with original music in various locations that are moving around the botanical gardens of Jerusalem. Uh, even though it's in Hebrew, I, I think you would have uh, appreciated the, the really in innovative insights in their staging and singing and chanting and dancing of the choruses. You, I think you would have grooved with it much more <laughs> maybe than some of the audience did. Uh, yeah, some thought it was pretty bizarre, but it was, it was, it was beautiful and experimental. Uh, anyway, um, uh, Professor Murnahan's uh, CV or list of publications also bristles with studies, solo and collaborative on reception, uh, dealing with literary and cultural issues extending from the ancient culture, ancient culture to modern. And in this, she's been exceptionally productive. Just to give you an idea of, of her range and virtuosity. Here's a partial, I stress partial list of, of, of comparanda. Uh, Yi Yun Li's Gilgamesh and Ali Smith's Antigone, the Minotaur, some Minotaur monstrosity in Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, antiquity, uh, acting and suffering in Oedipus and at Colonus and King Lear, Xerxes' powers and Xerxes' desires in modern women's poetry, um, uh, the reception of uh, Ovid's uh, Arachne in works for children, uh, so again, Soxy transformation uh, in children's literature, Robert Graves' Vera Historia, um, uh, uh, thwarted Nostos in the Kirikon, Re Rebecca West, the, the, less, the, 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 the list uh, goes on, uh, including uh, Louise Gluck, uh, Mary Butts, Naomi Mitchison, and so forth, uh, in, up to the books that she did with Ralph Rosen, called Hip Sublime Beat Writers in the Classical Tradition. The title alone uh, is, I think it's worth the price. Anyway, today's lecture uh, uh, is apparently um, a continuation of a favorite topic that is children's literature. The title, Return to Windy Troy, Sight and Text in the Homeric Tradition. Bridget. Oh, thank you. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. Um, Uh, thank you very much for that um, introduction. I first want to say just how deeply honored I am to have been invited to give this keynote address. And I feel all the more so after hearing yesterday 
about the distinguished 50 year history of this organization. And also how happy I am to finally be delivering it, even if I cannot do so in person, which I had very much looked forward to doing um, first originally in June, 2020, and then again now in 2021. So I'm really very sorry that I'm not there with you in person. Like my presence here, my topic has its roots in plans for the spring of 2020. I knew I would wanna speak about something related to a graduate seminar on Troy and Homer that I was co-teaching that semester with my archeologist colleague, Brian Rose, who had excavated at Troy for 25 years. The course involved a field trip to visit the site of Troy over spring break, which we just managed to fit in during March of last year before we came home to a completely changed world. The relationship between the physical site and the legend that we know from the Homeric epics was of course a central theme of that course, both for the divergences between the stories told by these two different forms of evidence and for the ways in which the site has been perpetually and inescapably viewed and materially shaped through the lens of the Troy legend as we know it from Homer and from other Greek sources. This was of course notoriously the case with the figure who will be the main focus of my talk, Heinrich, uh, Heinrich Schliemann, the larger than life 19th century excavator of Troy, whose work was animated by the desire to find material confirmation of the Troy legend. But the close identification of site and legend is still going strong, even as the more recent research has opened up greater space between them. Schliemann found the confirmation that he sought when he dug down through many layers that held no interest for him to find the trove of much earlier Bronze Age gold that he was sure was the treasure of King Priam. But more recent excavations suggest that the city that actually belonged to the period of the supposed Trojan War may not have been as wealthy, populous, and dominant as the Iliad suggests. And contemporary Hittite sources place Troy not on one side of a great east-west conflict, but in the middle of an ongoing series of skirmishes and shifting alliances involving the Mycenaean Greeks to the west and the Hittites, who are not even mentioned in the Iliad, to the east. Yet our ability to reconstruct this alternative non-Homeric history is hampered by Schliemann himself, since a likely late Bronze Age archive lies beyond reach under a monumental heap of material that he dug up and dumped. And meanwhile, the ongoing desire to link the site with the legend has made the question of the size and prosperity of late Bronze Age Troy a heated subject of debate among archeologists. And of course that wish continues to drive the site's presentation to the general public and especially as a tourist attraction. And here's our group arrayed in front of the, of the giant Trojan horse that is positioned just outside the site. The aspect of Schliemann's close connection to mythology that I wanna focus, focus on today is, somewhat, is something a little different and pertains to another interest of mine, um, with, along with Homer and the Troy legend. Um, you've heard a bit about that, which is children's literature and the question of how to present both um, the ancient world and the modern project of studying the ancient world, um, how, the, how those subjects are um, presented to and received by children. Uh, this seems particularly fitting for this occasion um, because it's an interest I share with Lisa Morris, who has played such an indispensable role in organizing this conference. And it connects with yesterday's session on the particular efficacy of classical mythology for autistic children, which unfortunately took place during what was for me still the middle of the night. It's also a topic that should concern any gathering of people committed to the promotion of classical studies because formative childhood encounters with the classical past and especially with its mythology play a vital role in getting people interested in studying antiquity and maybe even becoming classicists themselves. Um, and that's something that uh, many of you may know from your own experience. 
This is an aspect of classical reception that we ignore at our peril. It also raises questions about how the appeal that myths make to the imagination um, can and should be reconciled with the more restrained and factual learning we ultimately want to transmit to those child recruits. I will be concerned both with how in his autobiographical writings, Schliemann connected his mission of excavating Troy with his own childhood experience of classical myth and with how Schliemann himself is portrayed in a pair of biographies written for child audiences, one from the mid 20th century and one from the early 21st century. And the title of my talk recalls in part the stirring title of the earlier of those biographies, The Walls of Windy Troy, which had a strong impact on me when I was a schoolgirl. Schliemann is at once a natural and a challenging subject for a biography directed to child readers. His life story combines an ascent from rags to riches, adventures on the sea and in the American West, and many impressive accomplishments in both business and archeology. span But he also displayed a number of morally dubious qualities, especially a propensity for lying or what might also be called myth-making. He began his life of purposeful and persistent striving as the son of a pastor in the Northern German village of Ankershagen, but he left home at the age of nine after the death of his mother and the disgrace of his father brought about by both sexual and financial transgressions. He then lived with an uncle who decided after a few years that he could not afford to continue Schliemann's education so at the age of 14, Schliemann began his working life as a grocer's clerk and then an errand boy. From these reduced circumstances, he rose through constant work, unremitting ambition, lucky breaks, good contacts, and the assiduous acquisition of languages to become a prosperous businessman. Weathering the early setback of a shipwreck on the North Sea when he was setting out to try his fortunes in Argentina, Schliemann went on to amass a large fortune as a commodities trader based in St. Petersburg, a banker in California during the gold rush, and a military contractor in the Crimean War. He was able to retire at the age of 42, and after a period of travel, he turned to archeology, span and the story of a self-made striver became the story of a seeker of historical truth. As his archeological successes at Troy and Mycenae captured the imagination of a broad public, Schliemann was quickly appropriated as an edifying role model for the young. At some point soon after a celebrated London exhibition of his Trojan discoveries in 1877 to 1881, the British children's periodical Peter Parley's Annual published an essay on Schliemann, which presents him as a modern exemplar of timeless classical wisdom. Dr. Schliemann's life is a splendid illustration of the saying of Virgil that labor conquers everything. Only let a boy or girl have some one real definite desire or purpose in life, and it is their own fault if sooner or later they do not attain to their desired goal no matter what obstacles seem to be in their way. This piece of moralizing epitomizes the intention often detected in writing for children of turning child readers into virtuous adults. Here, by imparting the values of a figure much admired in Victorian Britain, though hardly forgotten now, the self-made man. Schliemann's use as an example exploits one of the most appealing figure, features of his biography the unbroken continuity it offers between childhood and adulthood, which here provides a rationale for recommending to children a premature adult single-mindedness. For on his account, Schliemann himself was already, as a boy, someone with a real definite desire or purpose in life. In a famous episode, described in several autobiographical writings, including one appended to Ilios, the volume published in 1880, describing his excavations at Troy, 
Schliemann formed the desire to uncover Troy at the age of seven in the course of an Oedipal struggle with his weak-minded father. My father related to me with admiration the great deeds of the Homeric heroes and the events of the Trojan War, always finding in me a warm defender of the Trojan cause. With great grief, I heard from him that Troy had been so completely destroyed that it had disappeared without leaving any traces of its existence. My joy may be imagined, therefore, when, on, when being nearly eight years old, I received from him in 1829 as a Christmas gift, Dr. Georg Ludwig Jerer's Universal History, with an engraving representing Troy in flames, with its huge walls and the ski and guide gate from which Aeneas is escaping. And here is that engraving. I cried out, father, you were mistaken. Yerer must have seen Troy, otherwise he could not have represented it here. My son, he replied, that is merely a fanciful picture. But to my question, whether Troy had such huge walls as those depicted in the book, he answered in the affirmative. Father, retorted I, if such walls once existed, they cannot possibly have been completely destroyed. Vast ruins of them must still remain, but they are hidden away beneath the dust of ages. He maintained the contrary, while I may remain firm in my opinion, and at last we both agreed that I should one day excavate Troy. As this resonant anecdote reveals, Schliemann's career not only features lifelong adherence to a, form, to, a, to a plan formed in childhood, but constructs in other ways a seamless connection between the separate realms of childhood and adulthood. The impressions formed by a child's active imagination are ratified by concrete factual discoveries in the real world. Mythology, which is a proper subject for young children, does not give way to history, as in a typical progression into adult understanding, often aided by schooling, but is rather revealed to have actually been historical truth all along. The walls of Troy did exist, and therefore the Troy legend must be true. The child's strong identification with the larger-than-life heroes of the story, reflected in Schliemann's self-description as a warm defender of the Trojan cause, is transmuted into real life heroism as the adult brings the buried city back from oblivion and makes it visible once again. The sufficiency of the child's will to determine the future is confirmed in the father's concession that the excavation of Troy is a foregone conclusion. In the story of Schliemann's life, childhood fantasy and adult reality coincide in a rare and satisfying harmony. This was noted by one of the great observers of the troubled relationship between fantasy and reality and the elusiveness of childhood desires, Sigmund Freud. Like many of his contemporaries, Freud was fascinated by Schliemann's story, and he wrote to his friend Wilhelm Fleiss, I gave myself a present, Schliemann's Ilias, and greatly enjoyed the uh, account of his childhood. The man was happy when he found Priam's treasure because happiness comes only with the fulfillment of a childhood wish. At the same time, Schliemann's biography presents significant obstacles to any writer who hopes to make him the straightforward hero of an upbeat, satisfying, and morally edifying account of success against the odds. He was not entirely honest in his business practices and left California under suspicion of short weighing consignments of gold dust. He was a relentless braggart and self-promoter who made inflated claims for his discoveries, many of which were questioned at the time. Far from reveling in the fulfillment of a childhood wish, Schliemann spent his later years contending with ridicule as well as admiration. Before he died, even he had to face the fact that the settlement lair at Troy that he had identified with the city described in Homer's Iliad and in which he had found the gold objects he labeled the treasure of Priam was in fact much earlier, dating to around 2500 to 2300 BCE rather than to around 1200. 
His excavation techniques were by today's standards reckless and destructive, with the result that a great deal of valuable evidence was lost. And he was unscrupulous not only in some of his business dealings, but also in removing objects from the sites where he found them, notably the treasure of Priam, part of which he was legally obligated by his agreement with the authorities to leave behind in Turkey, <clears throat> but which he didn't do. Perhaps worst of all, from the perspective of a biographer, recent scholarship has shown that many details of Schliemann's autobiography were self-mythologizing fabrications, including the famous account of his childhood vocation to discover Troy. The work of a number of American scholars in the 1970s and 1980s, among them William Calder III and especially David Trail, author of a biography subtitled Treasure and Deceit, has convincingly demonstrated that Schliemann made this story up and, for, and, and he did so for a far from admirable motive. He was feuding with an Englishman, Frank Calvert, over who first had the idea to dig for Troy at the mound known as Hisarlik. And he wanted to shore up his false claim to priority on this particular point with a general claim to have been long interested in the site of Troy. In fact, his interest in Troy probably dated to 1868 when he was 46. This fabrication not only helped him to score a point against Calvert, but also allowed him to attribute in retrospect a noble purpose to his years of assiduous money-making. This is clear from the way he introduces the topic of how he amassed his fortune in his autobiography. I find it necessary to relate how I obtained the means which enabled me in the autumn of my life to realize the great projects I formed when I was a poor little boy. In retrospect, this revelation does not seem, this revelation that his the, um, childhood anecdote was made up does not seem so surprising given the many exceptionally satisfying features of this anecdote. And it serves to show that an exceptional gift for storytelling should be counted among Schliemann's many undeniable talents. Just as Schliemann's investment in Trojan mythology sets the terms for our engagement with the site of Troy, so his own myth-making inevitably sets the terms for those who retell his story, including the biographers writing for young audiences with whom I am particularly concerned. I'll be looking at two biographies by American authors, writing primarily for American audiences, but I do have an ongoing interest in how Schliemann is presented in the children's literature of different countries, and I'd certainly be interested in hearing about any Hebrew versions that there may be. The two biographies I'll be talking about are separated by a period of several decades. One comes from 1960 and another from 2006 a period during which the extent of Schliemann's lying was much more fully exposed. Both those revelations and changing ideas about biographical writing for children lead to differences in how these two authors present his character flaws and how they construe the relationship between his childhood and his adult experiences. But despite these differences, both end up by presenting Schliemann to their child readers as an inspiring visionary with an active imagination like their own. Marjorie Bramer's The Walls of Windy Troy, first published in 1960, begins with an exciting, skillfully told narrative of Schliemann's rise to wealth and prominence in early adulthood, which occupies the first half of the book before being followed by an informative account of his archeological discoveries. Bramer follows Schliemann's own lead in foregrounding the seamless connection between his childhood and his adult life. Echoing the child Schliemann's fascination with Yerer's illustration, she highlights the walls of Troy in her evocative title, and she structures her narrative in such a way as to underscore the role of his childhood experiences in the formation not only of his adult actions, but of his adult consciousness, which she freely imagines with her story largely focalized through Schliemann himself. In the early chapters of the book, Bramer makes strategic use of flashbacks 
to emphasize the formative impact of Schliemann's childhood and to present him as fortified at difficult low moments by childhood memories. She begins her story when he is 19, just entering adulthood and seeking to rise from his status as a grocer's assistant. A few pages into the book, <clears throat> we find him waiting on a dock in Hamburg, uh, where he wants to negotiate with a sea captain who he hopes will give him passage to new opportunities in South America. Something was delaying the captain and the longer Heinrich waited, the more edgy he felt. Things must go right for him. He went back in his memory to his father's study to a Christmas when he was, let's see, seven or eight. There then follows a recapitulation of the conversation in which he insists to his father that he will find Troy. His father had smiled. It sounded like a child's boasting, but the desire had grown into the fabric of his will. Even the dreary years of drudgery in the grocer's shop could not shake this dream. This is followed soon after by another such recollection, which occurs during the shipwreck in the North Sea that cuts that journey to South America short <clears throat> and involves another fictitious episode from Schliemann's autobiographical writings. As he struggles in the turbulent waves, Heinrich hears in the sound of the sea the beautiful sounds of Homeric Greek, which he allegedly heard for the first time when a drunken student came into the grocer's shop where he was working and started reciting lines from, from the Iliad, <clears throat> which at that point seemed to Heinrich the most beautiful sounds he had ever heard. The scene kept coming into, proper, into sharper focus. The face of the student was clear now, and he was wagging a finger at Heinrich saying, I'll tell you something. The professor of Greek was so jealous of the way I recited Homer that he had me booted from the university. And my father thinks I drink too much. So he's apprenticing me to a miller. In this story, as in the one involving his father, the invaluable stimulus provided by a classical education is transferred to the receptive Heinrich from someone too weak to take proper advantage of it. Bramer treats these stories as both factual and revealing, and they lay the ground for a largely positive picture of her protagonist. Throughout her narrative, Bramer portrays Schliemann as a heroic figure and foregrounds the purpose-driven determination that, ex that he exemplifies in Peter Parley's annual without adopting the same overtly didactic stance. Following a long time tendency in biographies of Schliemann, she assimilates him to Odysseus, a figure who wandered and experienced setbacks, but was always animated by a clear and precious goal. Every chapter has an epigraph from an ancient text, most often the Odyssey, with the earliest ones drawn from the adventures of Telemachus. Most create a clear identification between Schliemann and his Homeric model, but one chapter is headed with the words with which Athena attempts to spur Telemachus to emulate his famous father, few sons are like their fathers, and then reports that Schliemann was determined that no one should be able to say about him, like father, like son. Bramer makes repeated use of Schliemann's childhood vocation to reinforce the same claim that he himself made, namely that his efforts to acquire a large fortune were motivated solely by his dream of finding Troy. <clears throat> he was pushing himself deliberately and tirelessly to be a successful businessman. The eventual goal was the discovery of Troy. He was marching on his way. Each time his wages increased, he felt he had moved a few steps farther. It would take money to be an excavator. It would take money to realize his dream. Very well, he would put his mind, his heart, his energies into making money. The first section of the narrative <clears throat> closes with a excuse me, <clears throat> closes with a climactic moment in Schliemann's accumulation of wealth. This occurs in 1854, when at the outbreak of the Crimean War, he has reason to fear that a large shipment of goods destined for St. Petersburg has been destroyed in a warehouse fire. Bramer neatly assimilates this threat 
to the lost of a path, um, this threat of lost um, commodities to the loss of a past civilization that is reversed by archeology. span Modern day commodities are equated with the buried past, which cannot be brought to light without them. They were standing on ground that still felt hot through their boots and the air was tainted with the smell of burned out ruins. The agent gestured toward the waterfront where patches of smoke still hung overhead. They are buried somewhere out there, he said. Out there, Heinrich repeated the words after him, there too his hopes, his life. There lay everything for which he had studied, saved, planned since boyhood. Two shiploads of indigo and war material, including saltpeter, lead, and brimstone. They would have been worth a king's ransom in Russia this very minute. His campaign for Troy lay buried under that stinking wreckage. By an extraordinary stroke of fortune, which effectively confirms Schliemann's heroic destiny, his shipment turns out to have been placed in an ancillary warehouse where it has escaped the fire. Schliemann then goes on to realize the king's ransom that ultimately allows him to find the treasure of Priam. In sum, the entire trajectory of Schliemann's early life is viewed through a teleological perspective that assumes everything he did was always leading to his excavation in Troy, something that in reality had not even occurred to him at this point. The next section of the narrative begins 14 years later in 1868, when Schliemann has retired from business and has traveled to Ithaca for his first tentative foray into Homeric archeology. span While Schliemann's visit to Ithaca inaugurates his second life as an archeologist with a successful excavation, he has yet to find complete fulfillment. This was a homecoming too, but he was lonely. For him, there was no Penelope. In this respect, as well as his quest for Troy, Schliemann is to be understood as wanting to achieve a childhood dream. In his autobiography, he describes sharing his ambition to find Troy with his childhood sweetheart, Minna. But he was thwarted because when he finally became rich enough to make Minna his wife, he discovered that she had already married someone else. He then embarked on an unhappy marriage with a Russian woman whom he ultimately divorced. Bramer attributes their difficulties to his dismissal of his Trojan dream as a wild notion. Why do you kill yourself making money and then sit up nights figuring out ridiculous plans to throw it away looking for an old buried city? I don't deny that I love money, he had defended himself to Catherine during one of their perpetual arguments. But I love it only as the means of realizing the great plan of my life. It is only when he marries his second wife, Sophia, a Greek woman, that Schliemann finds his proper mate. And Bramer's account of his triumphant discoveries at Troy and Mycenae emphasize her constant presence at his side. Bramer's final chapters on the last years of Schliemann's life are necessarily less exuberant as they recount his waning energy, his humbling acceptance of his own misattributions and his education in more systematic archeological methods. But her vision of Schliemann is consistently heroic, not only on the model of the epic adventurer, but also of the tragic hero who is marked by flaws that are nonetheless implicated in his greatness. Admitting in her foreword that some of the details in his various accounts of his life do not entirely add up, she sees that as bound up with the same virtue for which he was recommended to 19th century children in Peter Parley's annual. The tendency to will events into shapes that would accord best with his desires was a lifelong characteristic of the man. To it might be attributed many, many of his successes as well as his mistakes. In assessing Schliemann's achievements as an archeologist in her epilogue, Bramer stresses his recognition of the importance of pottery for dating and his opening up of the field of Greek prehistory rather than his sensational finds. And she is scrupulous in acknowledging his limitations. He went too fast and destroyed some evidence that it would be useful to have. He rushed into print with theories that could not be proved. But she adds, that none of these very human tendencies lessens the value of his lasting contributions 
perhaps suggesting that with, with that very human, not just an excuse for Schliemann's errors, but some admiration for the human virtues of ambition and initiative. Despite these concessions, she concludes with a ringing, if improbable, affirmation. Without his stubborn determination and passionate faith, we would be wondering to this day about the buried city of Troy and the life of Bronze Age people. The author of my second example, uh, Laura Amy Schlitz, also promotes a heroic conception of Schliemann, which she announces in her title, The Hero Schliemann, The Dreamer Who Dug for Troy, even though she was writing nearly a half century later, when the extent of Schliemann's falsifications was much better known. Her book is explicitly targeted to nine to 12 year olds, a somewhat younger audience than Bramer was writing for, and mo more overtly addressed to children, children construed as readers who cannot be expected to know very much about the ancient world, but who might also be leery of anything too obviously educational, for whom information is best presented in a playful or jokey manner. In terms of its educational goals, Schlitz's book in some ways reflects the conceptual shift that occurred in biographical writing for children during the 1970s. The stress in earlier biographies is on the inspiration to be derived from a successful life, which goes back to the time of Peter Parley's annual and derives ultimately from ancient ideas about biography as a kind of a record of exemplary figures who should be emulated. Um, it, and um, that sort of earlier view, I think, was also accompanied by tolerance for the kind of blatant fictionalization that is reflected in Bremer's reconstructions of Schliemann's conversations and inner thoughts. This gave way to a greater emphasis on historical accuracy. The lessons to be learned from biographical accounts of historical figures are as much about the writing of history as about how to live well. As the publisher's blurb to Schlitz's book puts it, the book can open a discussion about how history sometimes comes to be written and sometimes needs to be changed. And these are questions that might pertain equally to the Trojan War and to Schliemann's own life. The book contains various discussions of historical method, such as a comparison of ancient time estimates based on numbers of generations with modern methods of dating. And Schlitz's book is much slimmer than Bramer's and filled with jaunty, somewhat cartoonish illustrations. Um, here's another example by a well-known illustrator, Robert Byrd, which make their own important contribution to Schliemann's portrayal. Throughout her text, Schlitz is forthright about Schliemann's uh, shortcomings. She does not try to explain away his pursuit for, of wealth for its own sake, boldly stating, all his life, Heinrich Schliemann craved money. She acknowledges his multiple fabrications, noting that most modern scholars think it was not until the age of 46 that Heinrich Schliemann made up his mind to look for Troy. She undercuts his grandiose claims with such admissions as, Heinrich was not the only man in Europe who believed in a real Trojan War and a real Troy. And she sets the record straight, pointing out that Schliemann's account of discovering the Troy gold alone with Sophia, who then carried it back to their quarters wrapped in a shawl, is a good story, still found in books, but not true. She is clear about his limitations as an archeologist. Today's archeologists mourn the carelessness of Heinrich's excavations and the dishonesty that made him hedge about his finds. So while Schlitz is clear that there is no reliable evidence for Schliemann's childhood, she nonetheless has a very high degree of investment in Schliemann as a child. She makes him a figure in whom her child readers can see themselves, both by telling about his childhood and by presenting him as a childlike adult. This orientation is reinforced by Bird's illustrations, one of which actually depicts the boy Schliemann reading and dreaming about Troy. And here we see the complicated relationship in illustrated books between text and image, which can sometimes tell different stories. In this case, the illustrator tells a story that the writer cannot, although it seems likely that she wishes that she could. 
Through her text, Schlitz establishes multiple points of continuity between the child and the man. While Bremer excuses Schliemann for very human tendencies, Schlitz downplays his adult transgressions by treating them as the behavior of a naughty child. Rather than suggesting that the child was always the man he would become, she portrays the grown man as somehow always a child. In keeping with this, Bird's depictions of the grown-up Schliemann often position him as a small figure in a large world, outfitted for archaeology in baggy clothes and an oversized hat that suggests a child's costume in a game of make-believe. Both of these features can be seen in the illustration that shows him discovering the Troy gold, where the original excavator seems to have morphed into a modern child visiting an already excavated and helpfully labeled site. In her straightforward acknowledgement of Schliemann's lying, Schlitz links it firmly to his childhood. She opens her story with an event inspired by another of his autobiographical uh, reminiscences. Here's the illustration of it. <laughs> Describing in one of his diaries a visit to Ankershagen that he took during his return trip from California to St. Petersburg in 1852, Schliemann tells how he recovered there ample evidence of his ambitious earlier self. I found the initials HS of my name a hundred times on the glass panes of our former dwelling house or on the tree in the garden or in the court where I had the habit to cut it when a child and on the large linden tree where I had perpetuated myself with a hatchet in two feet long initials. The latter appeared so fresh as if made only a month ago. The opening sentence of Schlitz's text reads, almost 200 years ago in Germany, a boy scratched his initials on a linden tree. After describing his appearance and his success in carving the H, she gives an account of how he completed his initials, followed by a remarkable digression on his name. The next initial, S, was tricky. He knew that from experience, he had carved his initial dozens of times before, and the curves of the S were hard to control. Nevertheless, he wanted to make his mark. He started on the S of his last name. His last name was Schliemann, and in the center of that German name is the English word lie. Perhaps now is as good a time as any to consider the subject of lying, because the boy Heinrich did not grow up to be a truthful man. Few people are entirely honest. Many people lie once in a while. Heinrich Schliemann lied more often than that. Although Schlitz admits that Schliemann was a worse liar than most, she also stresses the normalcy of lying. By tying Schliemann's lying to his childhood and his name, she suggests that it was an inescapable birthright, perhaps an inheritance from his disreputable father. Further, her depiction of a boy cutting into a tree subtly evokes for American readers a famous story that presents a child who does not lie as an exceptional figure. This story, which is as fictitious as Schliemann's accounts of his childhood, concerns America's founding culture hero, George Washington, and a cherry tree. In this exemplary episode, introduced by Mason Locke Weems in the 1806 of his hagiographic biography and repeated in its many subsequent reprints, the boy Washington acquires a hatchet at the age of six, and as he tries it out, ends up cutting down a cherry tree. When confronted about this by his father, he struggles for a moment, <clears throat> but then comes out with the truth. I can't tell a lie, Pa. You know I can't tell a lie. I did cut it with my hatchet. The story is an often evoked touchstone of American culture, and here are just um, two of hundreds of depictions. Um, here's a sort of re more re recent one, and here's a more elegant 19th century depiction that includes um, the imp all-important father figure. Um, the hatchet, um, which is a familiar detail, provides a suggestive link, which although this is left unexpressed by Schlitz, between Washington's action and Schliemann's diary entry. Washington's stellar honesty is ascribed by Weems to the exceptional efforts of his noble father, who succeeds in imparting adult virtues to him ahead of schedule. 
Never did the wise Ulysses take more pains with his beloved Telemachus than did Mr. Washington with George to inspire him with an early love of truth. Schliemann, of course, differed significantly from Telemachus and so also from George Washington in not having an exceptionally wise father to emulate. Far from being the idealized exceptional role model of 19th century moralizing literature, Schlitz's 21st century Schliemann has throughout his life the failings that are generally attributed to most children. Lying has a particular association with childhood that is reflected in the frequency with which it is addressed in children's literature, Carlo Collodi's Pinocchio from 1944 being only the most famous example. While Schlitz espouses uh, the disapproval of lying as a moral lapse to be found in the works of Mason Weems and Carlo Collodi. She also reflects a competing tendency in children's literature, especially of the last half century, to treat lying in aesthetic rather than moralizing terms as an expression of the imagination. What, when she retells the unsubstantiated story of Schliemann's Christmas debate with his father, she leaves room for doubt and testifies to Schliemann's fictional gifts by pointing out the plausibility of his claim. Who can say? The Iliad is a story of courage, violence, and splendor, the kind of story that can set the imagination on fire. Further, she suggests that the imagination behind the story is specifically that of a child. And this is not impossible. It is children, after all, who dare to dream wild dreams. It is children who make up their minds that they will one day be rich and famous and that their lives will not be commonplace. Instead of encouraging her child readers to become prominent and successful themselves by following Schliemann's example, Schlitz asks them to recognize the fantasy of spectacular success as a universal feature of childhood and entertain the possibility they might not have been lying or at least recognize in themselves the impulse behind his lies. Schlitz again treats Schliemann's most questionable qualities as those of a perpetual child when she is forced to describe how Schliemann smuggled Priam's treasure out of Turkey. Um, on the one hand, he, um, uh, he could not stand to part with any of the treasure. Heinrich had a childish, finder's keepers feeling about the Trojan gold. It was his connection to Homer, something he could not let um, something he could hold in his hands. He had borne heat and dust and ridicule for it. He could not let it go. Here, what might be presented as duplicity and greed is depicted as wholly understandable, indeed as right and logical from a child's perspective and inextricable from the pure and noble dream associated with Homer. Rather than being invited to emulate the adult Schliemann even in childhood, Child readers are here being encouraged to sympathize with him on the basis of their own children's system of values. The one act of Schliemann that Schlitz finds hard to write off as a form of childish naughtiness is his crime against historical method, his disruption of the stratigraphy of Troy through the wanton digging of a trench. To illustrate the principle of stratification, she gives a child-friendly explanation by means of a familiar analogy. In order to understand Heinrich's work, imagine you've tossed everything that you've ever owned into a heap in the middle of the floor. On the top of the mound would be the clothes you wore yesterday. Lower down, uh, the clothes would be smaller. Legos, Legos and puzzle pieces would get bigger. At the bottom of the mound would be baby clothes, board books, and rattles. If you looked at the mound like an archeologist, you'd see all the layers of your past life. You might keep a sharp eye out for anything that might help you assign dates to the various strata. If, for example, you found your second grade report card next to a plastic stegosaurus, you might guess that second grade was the year you were crazy about dinosaurs. Now, suppose your mother wanted to give away the red boots you loved when you were four. Suppose she tore apart your mound like a dog looking for a bone. What had once been an orderly mess would become chaos. The original layering, which made sense, would become chaos. What Heinrich Schliemann did at Hisserlich was quite a bit like that. In connection with this graver crime, the errant Schliemann is not the sympathetic child, but that child's nemesis, the unsympathetic parent 
the hard-hearted pragmatic mother who wants to give away the beloved boots and does not sh share the child's emotional attachments. And yet this is not an entirely negative portrayal. Um, this mother is certainly not as bad as Schliemann's inadequate father. The comparison of the mother to a dog digging up a bone brings her into the child-friendly sphere of pets, with which Schliemann is elsewhere identified by the cat in Bird's depiction of his childhood reading, and by the information that in his later years, Heinrich doted on the family dog and a kitten he had rescued from Hiserlich. And children do know that they should not throw all their things in a heap on the floor. And it is a good thing to give away what they have outgrown and cannot use. So maybe there was a certain disorderly waywardness to that ancient mound through which Schliemann just sliced in his dogged pursuit of answers. When Heinrich Schliemann made the inspired move of inventing a childhood for himself and presenting it as the indispensable key to his entire life story, he accomplished far more than simply scoring a point in his feud with Frank Calvert. He drew on perennial associations of childhood with innocence, optimism, magic, unfettered imagination, and the deep past to give a positive cast to adult behavior that could be described as greedy, deceptive, ruthlessly competitive, and self-aggrandizing. Schliemann's fictional childhood has shaped the reception of his story from the time it was first promulgated in the 1880s, and its impact is magnified in versions of his life told to children. As my two examples make clear, this is no less the case when the author is fully aware that her subject's childhood was an adult's fabrication. <clears throat> Bramer's The Walls of Windy Troy capitalizes fully on the advantages that Schliemann's invented childhood offers for effective storytelling. His early vocation provides the starting point for a clear teleologically driven narrative arc from childhood resolve to adult fulfillment, which organizes all of the events of the hero's life and extends to all, and extends to all of them the same appeal to the reader's sympathies. In the hero Schliemann, Schlitz may not make a similarly straightforward claim to narrate Schliemann's actual childhood, but she also relies on the idea of Schliemann as a child to make him a sympathetic figure. By replacing the lifelong plan and purpose recommended in Peter Parley's annual and dramatized by Bramer with childlike powers of the imagination, Schlitz is able to celebrate Schliemann's undoubted gift for fiction as equal to and indispensable for his achievements in archaeology. Tellingly, she ends her book by presenting Schliemann's myth-making as an essential part of his legacy, which transcends and redeems his unsavory mendacity. Heinrich Schliemann wanted his life to be like a story, and it was. His rampant imagination changed archaeology forever. Some of, his, some of the tales he told, like the tale of Sophia wrapping Priam's treasure in her red shawl, are everlasting, false though they may be. Heinrich's stories are chronic and irresistible. They are part of the Schliemann legacy. Storyteller, <clears throat> archeologist and crook, Heinrich Schliemann left his mark upon the world. So at least in the realm of children's literature, the myths that Schliemann invented about himself remain as stubbornly attached to his persona as the chronic and irresistible myths of the Trojan War um, that he championed are attached to the site of Troy. That raises interesting questions for classicists about how we make use of fantastic tales from classical myth and, and heroic conceptions of classical scholarship to convey the interest of our field to young readers. Doing so seems vital for keeping the field afloat, especially at a time of diminishing support for the humanities and true to our own experiences. Certainly in my case, as I found the walls of Windy Troy quite inspirational. But there are some interesting tensions here. We want to nurture the imaginative appeal of the ancient world, but we also want our students eventually to see antiquity as a complicated place that doesn't particularly correspond to childhood fantasies. And to appreciate classical scholarship, and especially classical archaeology, 
as a methodical collaborative discipline rather than a great individual adventure. This is one version of a perpetual tension between the aims of pleasure reading and the aims of education, which plays out in the ways that children's literature often appeals to qualities adults see as childlike with the ulterior motive of teaching them to be more like adults. But that tension may be especially pronounced for us right now at a time when we are trying to think ourselves out of inherited myths about antiquity, feeling increasingly uncomfortable about presenting the classical world as a time of exceptional greatness and the study of the classics as an exceptionally noble pursuit. But the questions that these books leave me with are finally less about the imaginative appeal of the Troy legend, which I would never want to deny, than about the implicit message that a strong enough will is sufficient to overcome the disadvantages imposed by limited means and lack of access to elite schooling, that anything is possible if one believes in one's dreams. And as we look to the future, one dream I would like to see come true would be for the inevitably smaller role of classics in traditional education to be offset by rewarding opportunities to encounter this material at other stages of life. So maybe, in addition to books like those by Bremer and Schlitz, we need accounts of Schliemann that celebrate what a glorious thing it was to get the idea of excavating Troy at the age of 46. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, okay. Thank you very, very much. That was absolutely fabulous. Um, I'm not gonna, have we got Mac? Okay, good. I'm gonna open the floor to questions, although if not, I probably have something I, I would like to ask anyway, but let's see who else has things uh, to ask either from the Zoom or in the room. Any questions? Uh, Sylvie, yeah, uh, the microphone is coming. You will be able to hear in a second, though possibly not see Sylvie. Hello, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have um, um, a question with uh, perhaps several sub-questions in it. Um, could you please uh, situate the, um, the, this uh, biography for children, I mean, Schliemann's biography for children? Um, because if I think, uh, I'll tell you what the subtext is. If I think of um, um, bringing the, the antiquity uh, closer to children. So I could think of what is uh, very common in modern Greece now, it is to, to, to have a version of the uh, Iliad uh, mm -hmm. for children. So here you, you don't have uh, Achilles' biography, you have Schliemann's biography. So um, it is, again, is it, is, is the, uh, the, the purpose to, to bring the antiquity closer to, um, to the children? Or, or is it also a way of uh, nostalgizing a form of uh, uh, European imperialism in, in these countries? Or what, and are they, and, and also, uh, so perhaps related to that, is uh, this biography exceptional or do we also have biographies of, uh, you know, the discovery of uh, um, Egyptian treasures. Um, um, and, and, and then what would make uh, Schliemann's biography um, exceptional? Is it because he himself wrote about his childhood or because it was a homer? Or, so, so if you could just situate his, his, um, this biography uh, further. Okay, uh, that was a lot of questions. So, um, uh, so first of all, you're right that this that that in terms of the presentation of antiquity to children, um, these are not really the sort of mainstream, which is indeed the retelling of ancient. I mean, you know, there's a much much larger body of of retelling of ancient myths for children. Um, uh, in this case, um, I would say. Um, that in terms of genres of children's literature, I mean, there's a very, very strong tradition of biographies for children. Um, I mean, when I 
was growing up, I read many, many biographies of important figures in American history, and I'm sure there are such in every national tradition. Um, and, and, as, and as I was saying, I think that this 1960 biography that I was reading is sort of at the tail end of a very, very long tradition of exemplary biography, um, where um, you're reading about the kind of great figures of the past and all they achieved, and you're supposed to be inspired to be like them. Um, so um, I think, um, it, I, I, and, and yes, I, I haven't really looked into the question. I mean, you're absolutely right that there undoubtedly are biographies of um, other, you know, other archeologists and other discoverers of ancient cultures and so forth. Um, it's not something that I've looked into as much as, as, as I probably should have. Um, and then your question about um, sort of the, I mean, there are, your, the question about sort of um, promoting European imperialism, um, I guess what I would say um, about that is I would say that both of these American um, biographies that I am looking at, um, are, I, I don't, I, I, I think that they're, they're, um, written, you know, sort of not without, not with any sort of <laughs> sense of that as a purpose, but with, with a kind of um, uh, obliviousness to that as an issue. Um, I don't think that either of them sees the question of a European coming and, and you know, um, coming to Turkey and telling the Turks that he understands their culture better than they do and, and digging it up. That those are, those are issues that are on the radar of these authors. Um, it would be interesting to see what someone taking on the subject now would do. Um, interestingly, um, I mean, it is interesting how um, this, the treatment of Schliemann differs from tradition to tradition. Um, and um, so, you know, and, and, and like the, the um, Bramer one plays up in its, like on, in the copy on the back of the book, his, the fact that he was an American citizen, um, which he was um, <laughs> briefly, although, you know, like, he became an American citizen with falsely obtained documents um, and not in the year that he said he did. Um, there are um, accounts of Schliemann for German children um, in which there's often a quite intimate um, connection between the children and Schliemann. And they get, um, it's, what's really interesting is they get um, drawn into helping him steal the Troy gold and they have qualms about it, but it's really okay because in the end he gives it to the German people um, and it becomes a treasure of the a national treasure, treasure of Germany. And that, that sort of, um, you know, softens that. So I don't know, that's a rambling answer to your very rich question, um, but I hope it answers part of it. Thank you. I, I think we're actually meant to start our next session now. Aren't we? Do we have time for another question or two? Okay, I know that Chava has one. Uh, Chava, you want to go ahead? Uh, yes, I just uh, wanted to note that uh, Schliemann, with all uh, his fantasies and all, he, he, he was uh, also uh, a, a tremendous uh, archivist and he had, uh, kept uh, all his letters and letters from himself. So there, there, there is a huge archive of Schliemann and some of his letters are published already. So we actually do have a huge amount of uh, stuff about him. So uh, I think that uh, the research on Schliemann <laughs> is <laughs> very promising too. And I, I uh, uh, cannot uh, um, uh, be quiet about it because, because he is uh, my hero from my childhood. So <laughs> <laughs> I visited his, uh, his mausoleum in, Ath in Athens and of course I've been in Troy too. So did you ever... Uh, 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 read some of of his uh, own letters because it's it's very interesting I think and it's, it's more interesting maybe than the fictional books about him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, he's a very complicated figure, and of course, the fact that he left so much documentation of his life has made it easier for people to expose his <laughs> fiction. So there's a there's a funny um, 
a, a funny um, tension there. And yeah, I think, um, yeah, and I think, you know, certainly not, it's, you know, the, <laughs> There are many questionable features of Schliemann, but I think he can also still be seen as heroic. And, um, you know, I was very interested, as I said, I was co-teaching this course with an archeologist who had, had dug at Troy for 25 years and was very careful um, to um, speak about Schliemann's accomplishments as well as the many, many frustrating ways in which he simply made it harder um, for his um, successors at the site. Um, so yes, um, it's very hard to escape the heroic Schliemann, I think, as, as you're attesting. <laughs> I, I think there's quite a trend at the moment as well to sort of romanticize uh, archaeologists. There was a, a TV uh, series on the discovery of Tutankhamun and one on, on Saturn Hu, uh, and they are very much these Victorian romanticized yeah. figures that I think this fits into, into it as well. Yeah. Uh, I think we have time literally for one more short question. If there is a short question, I know we could keep talking for a while. Uh, Margalit. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor Merlingen, for, for, for your talk. Actually, it's not a question, it's a comment to Sylvie's question. Why Schliemann? I think the uh, uh, answer is uh, very simple. He was a fascinating figure by, uh, by any standards. And uh, uh, when uh, teaching uh, uh, about uh, uh, Troy myself, uh, I used to tell uh, students the entire history, and uh, I always told them that uh, he was an ugly customer, but, uh, <laughs> but, but they were fascinated nevertheless, because it is, uh, uh, in fact, there is uh, something special in, uh, in his story, background or no background, I agree with everything. Uh, uh, you said, but uh, yes, he, he is interesting and there is no, uh, I think, connection to uh, c colonialism or whatever. <laughs> Just a fascinating figure, sorry. Yeah. 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 Just great material, which is really what we've just been exposed to for the last hour. So uh, on behalf of everybody at, on Zoom and in the room, I'd just like to thank you again, Professor Monahan. It has been a really a fascinating and exciting hour. And I think we could, we're going to be talking about it for a while. Uh, so thank you again. And I'm now going to hand straight over to Eleonora, who, even though she's not here in Israel, is going to be chairing the next session. Okay. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs>